let's continue with our service. Thank you so much for joining us today. As we dive into Backyard Conversations this weekend, we will be discussing sensitive topics not advised for those fourth grade and younger. We strongly encourage parents to make sure your children join Chapel Kids during service. And if you need any assistance in registering your kids, be sure to stop by Starting Point in the main lobby. Thank you for your understanding, and we're so glad that you're here with us today.
come this morning. We serve an eternal God who was and is and is forever to come. His name is Jehovah, God who always is, the great I am. Let's learn this chorus together. This is how it goes. Here we go. Who call the name, call the name, call the name, Jehovah. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord is our provider. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord is our healer. And Jehovah Shalom, God is our peace. Let's declare this. Here we go. Jehovah Nisi, fight your battles. Jehovah Jireh, meet your need. Jehovah Rapha, heal your body. Jehovah Shalom.
Oftentimes, we may have heard those names of our God when we pray. And I think it's important for us to learn those. And back in the Old Testament, oftentimes just letters were used for the name of God. Out of reverence, not even to be able to utter his name of who God is. And as we look in scripture, we see God referred to as Adonai, Yahweh, Jehovah. Lord who is, he always is. And those names were an opportunity for God's people to recognize also that yes, God is eternal above all reverend. But he's also a personal God who we can come to and we can call on the name. And so church, would you just sing that again with us? I know we're learning this new. But let's call on the name. Sing, call the name. Call the name.
great. We thank you for what you have done, your work on the cross to save a sinner like me. Jesus, you are worthy of our worship. You are the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one who's worthy. And today we choose to put you first. We choose to worship you. And Jesus, I pray that you would just continue to draw us close to yourself today as we are here in your house. Lord, open our hearts up to your word as we prepare to look at that. And we thank you for what you have done, Jesus. And it's in that name I pray and everybody in the room said, amen, amen. Hey, it's really good to sing together to lift up the name of Jesus. You can have a seat if you're here in this room. If you're joining us online, welcome as well. We're glad to have you here. It is good to be in God's house this Sunday morning. So thank you for joining us. And I know we say this a lot, but we believe it with all of our heart that Jesus transforms lives. And we believe that if you've said yes to Jesus, that he has transformed your life and that we are set on a new journey with him. And uh, when we journey through life, we're not meant to live this life alone. As we pursue Jesus, we are meant to be in community with one, one, uh, one another. I'll get that out. <laughs> but uh, we're supposed to be in community with each other and uh, not do this on our own. So we're excited. That's why we started small groups here at the church. So we could find a place where we can lock arms with each other, fellowship with each other, study God's word, and just share life. And so this weekend and for the next three weeks, we've got tables out in our lobby. We would love to invite you at the end of service to head on out there. If you have any questions regarding small groups, we've got some fantastic people who would love just to come alongside and answer those questions. Also, you can register for a small group in person uh, this weekend at one of those tables as well. Online, you can register. And we just are praying that this is just a, a, a huge small group season where we see this church connect in ways in small groups. And as we get ready for the message, we have a testimony of a couple who have come through a season of small groups. And we just wanted to share with you how that has impacted their lives. So church, let's take a moment, turn our attention to the screens, and let's hear their story now. We had really gotten discouraged over the last four years trying to figure out where um, the Holy Spirit was leading us. Um, it's a passion that I've looked forward to find guys that I can grow in Christ with. And I was really struggling finding that. Um, we actually, you know, felt very alone. She had had the same issue. We really took it upon ourselves to try to find a place where we felt at home and we had a family in Christ. I came across the Bible Chapel, um, and one of the things I read in the comments section um, was how many small groups they actually offered. And when I found out about that opportunity, it really made me want to join the church. I actually signed up for three or four men's small groups um, and the Living Ground before I ever even attended church here. I've grown so much by being in a small group and letting myself be vulnerable with other women. And it just was very freeing to let it all go, um, to be open with other people. Seeing these people that I, I felt like from the outside were saints, right? They didn't do the things I did. They just, they lived a perfect life. And I was so nervous to ever open up. It wasn't until I joined this church and started getting into these small groups and finding out these people are just like me. It's been so amazing to have these gentlemen be able to pour into me um, and help me through that. You just get more support when you're around people that truly care for you. I had to have an emergency surgery and I had just joined a small group. I'd been to maybe two uh, of the meetups and I had the surgery and my phone started blowing up right away with people praying for me, reaching out just to see how they could help out. It was just crazy to feel the love of God through these people in a way that we had never had experienced before. Especially for somebody that you you don't You'd only met them twice. I mean, that, that hit me hard to see how much love that we had found um, within our small groups. I barely even knew them, but they loved me so much because I'm a child of God and they just they had so much love for me. It was so overwhelming. We need that connection, that fellowship, an opportunity to grow. You know, iron sharpens iron and we sharpen each other. We can't do it by ourselves. Um, it was the people in those small groups that truly helped me understand that man am I part of this like and that's the, it's just been beautiful yeah, to feel like you belong yeah well, it's great to see everyone here in person and all of you online as well I just want to remind you be sure you sign up for a small group 
Here at the Bible Chapel, uh, we have uh, some people coming, right? So you can't know everyone, but you need to know someone, and someone needs to know you. So uh, get involved in a small group, and that's uh, what some real life-on-life life things happen. Uh, we want to remind you, today, after this service, is Discover TBC. Encourage you to go to that. Discover TBC, if you're new with us, is where you find out about the little history of our church, where we're headed as a church, mission, vision, answer any questions uh, that you have. And so uh, right after this service, Discover TBC. And if you look at our growth chart, right after Discover TBC, we have um, a, a discipleship curriculum called Living Grounded. Living Grounded is uh, based on uh, the foundations of the Christian faith. And we want to get you involved in that. We want to get you grounded. Then small groups, Team TBC, outreach, a lot of opportunities here uh, for you. So again, to start with Discover TBC and then get all your questions answered from there. All right, let's pray and ask God for his help today. Father, we thank you. <clears throat> You're a God who loves us. You care for us. You know us by name. When we walked in here today, Lord, you already knew the challenges that we're going through the joys that we're experiencing, the things, Lord, that, uh, that we need from you. And uh, we are needy people. We need you desperately. I pray, Father, that you'd be with us as we look at your word today. Teach us as only you can do. And uh, Lord, I pray that as we work through your word today, uh, Lord, that you would bring comfort or comfort needs where you would bring healing forgiveness. Lord, just, just, just work in our hearts, we pray today. Totally dependent on you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us for this Backyard Conversation Summer Series. We heard from you the things that you wanted to talk about. Uh, next week, Dave will be starting uh, on uh, parenting and then end times and race relations, some things you wanted to hear about. Uh, then Tom Rojan, our campus pastor in Robinson, will conclude the series regarding the nature of sin. The last two weeks, we've talked about the LGBTQ community, plus community, and uh, talked about that. We wanted to do that uh, in truth and in love. And today, one of the things you wanted to hear about was more, we've talked about this a lot here at the Bible Chapel, was more about marriage, and specifically marriage and Divorce, marriage and divorce, kind of a big topic in our culture. Let me start with a story. How many of you heard of, how many have you heard, have heard of Nancy Mace? Nancy Mace, anyone? Nancy Mace is a congresswoman. Uh, she is from uh, South Carolina, Congress, Republican congresswoman from South Carolina. And uh, last week she spoke at a prayer breakfast, okay? Spoke at a prayer breakfast. In her opening remarks, her speech at a prayer breakfast, she said, hey, when I got up this morning, my fiance tried to pull me back into bed to have sex. And I said, not time today. I'm speaking at her prayer breakfast and I can't be late. I told him, I'll take care of the intimate needs when I get home at a prayer breakfast. Nancy Mace is uh, divorced twice, now living with her fiance. I'm not here to judge Nancy Mace. I'm just telling you in our culture, marriage is treated very flippantly, right? Even by conservative Republicans. So what we wanna do is to see what Jesus says. What does Jesus say about marriage and divorce? Now I wanna say from the very beginning, I, I get it. Some of you here have lived through the absolute hell of unwanted divorces. It's been painful. I understand that. I also understand some of you did everything you could to fight for your marriage and just didn't work out. Hang with me on this, all right? Some of you uh, maybe were part of the divorce process and you are living with a lot of regrets. Some of you are in a second marriage. We get it. 
So we're going to talk about a lot of things today. But we always go back to see what the Bible says, right? And we want to see what Jesus says. So take your Bibles and open to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19, a story uh, about marriage and divorce. And let me read the first three verses and then set the context. Now when Jesus... This is Matthew 19, verse 1. Now, when Jesus had finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee, and he entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And a large crowd followed him, and he healed them there. And the Pharisees came to him and tested him by saying, Is it lawful, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? All right, that's the question. Let's set the context. When you read in verse one that this is the region of Judea beyond the Jordan, you can see on this map, see the Dead Sea there at the bottom, the region uh, that we're in now is Perea. See that area right there? That's Perea. The significance of that is Herod Antipas is the tetrarch of Perea. Remember the story about Herod? Herod divorced his wife and he married his half-brother's ex-wife named Herodias, and John the Baptist came into Perea and said, you shouldn't do that, condemned the marriage, and remember what happened to John the Baptist. He literally lost his head, right? And so the Pharisees are hoping that Jesus will say something that will tick off Herod, and Jesus will be killed right there in Perea. Something else is going on. In that day, the Pharisees, under, under uh, Judaism, right? The Judaism was a big tent. There were liberals and conservatives. And Judaism had this big debate going on about Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1. In Deuteronomy 24, verse 1, it says this, when a man takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of the house and she departs out of the house. All right, there's more to that. You can read the last three verses, but we'll stop there. There was a school called Shammai. Shammai was um, the head of the Sanhedrin right before Jesus entered into his ministry. Very strict. The school of Shammai was very, very strict. And when they went to Deuteronomy chapter 24, 1, they said indecency only means one thing. It means sexual immorality. The only way you could have divorce, a reason for divorce, and the certificate of divorce is sexual immorality. That was the school of Shammai. You also had, right before Shammai, was a guy named Hillel who, who led the Sanhedrin. He was a little more, um, let's just say, liberal. And he said, went to this same verse, and he said, man, the word indecency doesn't just mean uh, sexual immorality, and it could be indecency for anything. And so he focused on this word some or any, in some translations, any indecency. And he famously said, even if your wife burns the dinner. That's an, in, that's an indecency, right? So you can divorce her. Later on, others said, if you find someone more attractive, you can divorce your wife as well. So you had these two schools going on, and uh, Jesus knows that, but notice he doesn't enter into the debate. By the way, this is very instructive to us. Jesus doesn't enter into the cultural debate, what does he do first? He goes right to scripture. So he says in verse four, he answered them, have you not read? That he, he who created them from the beginning made them male and female. He's quoting Genesis chapter one, verse 27. He's going back to say, God made the male, it's a gender word. God made the female, that's a gender word. If we're gonna talk about marriage and divorce, let's just start by saying it's between a male and a female. 
Then Jesus says this. Now he's quoting from Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. He says, have you not read? Or he says, therefore, verse 5. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That verse is first in Genesis 2, 24. Repeated by Jesus in the Gospels, repeated by Paul in his letter to the Ephesians. And this verse gives us the three essentials of biblical marriage. Let's think through it. What's the first thing? A man will leave his father and his mother. Father and mother are those who brought you into this world. They nourished you. They cared for you. They raised you up. They bought you braces, for goodness sake, right? I mean, they've done all these things for you. They, they are the most loving relationship you've had to this time. But when you get married, you now leave the emotion of that relationship. You still talk to your folks for sure. You leave the emotion of that relationship and your emotion and your person is now committed to your husband or to your wife. By the way, um, there's this thing in scripture called greater to lesser. So the greater, right, would be father and mother. They brought you into the world. The lesser would be an old boyfriend or an old girlfriend or your, the guys you play video games with or golf outings or whatever it is. You can still do those things appropriately, but, but the emotion now is with that one person. And here's what you find. You leave your father and your mother in marriage and you wake up one day and you learned you married a stranger, right? A stranger. By the way, we're going to do a class in the fall of marriage enrichment. We'll talk much more about marriage in that class. I'll tell you more about it in a little bit. But today, let's just think about this. You married a stranger. So Tim Keller has this great book called Meaning of Marriage. And in one chapter, he has, he has a chapter called Loving the Stranger. He says that, you know, the in love phase is, is there for a while. And then you begin to see the flaws, and now I'm quoting Keller, we begin to feel that we really didn't know the person at all. And this presents us with the challenge of loving a person who at the moment seems in large part a stranger, not the person you remember marrying. Anyone relate to that? Do not raise your hand if you do. <laughs> but it's all about commitment, isn't it? Because you leave the emotional, mother, father, all that stuff, and now you are committed to your husband or wife. And that's the second part. Hold fast to your spouse. Hold fast to your wife. I love that word, hold fast. In the Hebrew, it's used three times. It's used here in Genesis 2.24. It's also used to describe the skin clinging to the bones. Isn't that a great picture of holding fast? And it's used... Um, uh, David had this, mighty, had this mighty warrior named Eleazar. And Eleazar had fought so long and so hard for, so, for, for such a long time. It says, it says in the scripture, his hand was frozen to his sword. That same word, hold fast. Frozen to his sword. And so scripture says you are frozen to each other. Does that mean I'm to stay married when I don't feel like I'm in love? Yes. Yes. Love's a feeling. In love is a feeling that comes and goes. C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity, he has a great uh, chapter on the Christian marriage. And he says, everybody loves the idea of marriage. Everybody loves the cool wedding. They love the, don't you love the plan a cool wedding. And then there's the reception, and that's so cool. And then, and then there, there, there's the pictures from the honeymoon that you could paste on Instagram. Isn't that cool? Now, Lewis didn't say that because he wrote this in 1945, but <laughs> that's what we do today, right? And so he says, then real life hits. And you don't have that in love feeling all the time. 
Here's what, here's what, here's what's cool. Instead of using the word justice, you know what Lewis uses? He says, now we're talking about justice. You stood before God and you made a commitment, better or worse, rich or poor, sickness and in health. Now we're talking about justice. You owe it to that person. Justice to, to nourish them and help them, not to bring pain in their life, not to bring economic hardship into their life. If you have children, it's justice that now, as a man and a woman, a husband and a wife, you are there to raise them. C.S. Lewis says, man, it becomes about justice. And that's what Jesus says in verse six. So there are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, what? Let men not separate. God joins you together. You, you say your vows to God. Let men not separate. So leave father and mother, united to wife, and then what? The two will become what? One flesh, one flesh, four things about one flesh. One flesh describes not just the sexual, it does that. It describes spiritual oneness. Two believers following Jesus together. It describes mental oneness. You're keeping all other options off the table. When you get married, there are no other options. You got one option. Emotional oneness, exclusive feelings, and this exclusive sexual commitment to one another. By the way, sex in marriage is so powerful, those others are powerful too, spiritual, emotional, um, all the things that, uh, that that means, spiritual, emotional, mental. Physical oneness is so powerful that Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, there was a thing going on in the Corinthian church that said we shouldn't have, married couples shouldn't have sex. That's, that's not godly. Paul said, no, it is godly and a husband's, wife, uh, husband's body doesn't belong just to him, but to his wife. And a husband and a wife's body doesn't belong just to her, but to her husband. And he says, make sure you come together and meet each other's needs. And by the way, it's so powerful. You are saying every time you're renewing this covenant of marriage. And he says, come together, lest Satan tempt you. Now, is it ever right to go outside of marriage for sexual fulfillment? No, no, absolutely not. But there are temptations when it's not fulfilled. All right, so the Pharisees hear this and they say, well, time out. Then why in the world did Moses allow them a certificate of divorce? You're saying you're in it for life. You're in it for keeps. You're in it for good. Then why would Moses do this? We don't get it. Fair question, legit question. So Jesus says, in verse eight, because of your hardness of heart. I, I wonder when we get to heaven and we really enjoy everything there, that Jesus will take us away sometime and say, you know, I let you do that because of the hardness of your heart, but it really was not what I wanted. Because of the hardness of your heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. Verse nine, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. Whoever divorces his wife, <clears throat> one exception, sexual immorality commits adultery. So there's the first biblical reason for divorce. First biblical reason, sexual immorality, adultery. The sexual uh, intimacy is so powerful that sexual adultery breaks that bond, breaks that covenant, breaks that, uh, that intimacy. Now, is lust emotional adultery? Yeah, Jesus says that. Right? But here, Jesus gives one exception, and that is physical adultery. Lust is a sin. But let's just be honest. Can we be honest together? If lust was a reason for divorce, everybody in the room who's married would have a reason for divorce. 
I thought that was kind of funny, but uh, I, guess, you know, <clears throat> I guess you guys didn't obviously think that was funny at all. All right. Physical adultery is, 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 a, is a, an intentional, premeditated breaking of the exclusive intimacy reserved for a husband and a wife. And Jesus says when that happens, and by the way, is this, is this continual adultery or one time, I believe one time, you have biblical grounds for it. Now, you have biblical grounds for divorce. Now, having said that, at the Bible Chapel, we always counsel first for forgiveness and reconciliation. Always. And we are so thankful that God, in many cases, and, and it's painful, <clears throat> and it takes time, it doesn't happen overnight, and there needs to be some counseling, but God has done some amazing and beautiful work through the, through the wounds toward forgiveness and restoration. So breaking the vow of marriage is a biblical grounds for divorce, not incompatibility, not we don't love each other any longer. And if I hear one more time, the kids are resilient, I'm gonna throw up. If you believe that, Check out this book. Wall, uh, uh, Judith Wallerstein, she wrote this. This is not biblically based at all. This is her research. She started following kids of divorced couples in 1971. And this is a 25-year study of that. I'll leave you to it. I'll let you read that. So adultery is one, right? It, are there, is there another reason for divorce? So you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Just jot this down. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to paraphrase it. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7, 10 through 14. There Paul says, remember, uh, uh, Corinthians are writing a bunch of questions to him, so he's answering questions. And he says there, you, you got this new church starting up. You got people coming from all kinds of backgrounds. You got pagans coming, and then they become a Christian. But, but, the, but the wife becomes a Christian, and the husband doesn't, or the husband does, and the wife doesn't. So you got an issue, right? And Paul says, even if your husband is not a believer and you are, you do not divorce him. Same thing, husband to wife. Only, only if, only if you're a believer, your husband's not a believer, you're a believer, your wife's not a believer, and he or she leaves. They say, I can't do this anymore. I'm leaving. I, I, I'm moving out of here then Paul says, let that person go. And in those two instances, uh, adultery or desertion, you're free to remarry. Adultery or desertion. Those are the two reasons. So if someone comes and says, I want to get married, here at the Bible Chapel. And I'm divorced. <clears throat> and um, we'll say, well, let's talk about that. Well, we just, we just fell out of love. This didn't love any, each other anymore. And, um, you know, that's, that's the sum. But I'm now ready for another relationship. We're going to say, time out. Jesus says, you should go work on that relationship. I know you don't want to hear that, but you should go do that. Because if you marry someone without biblical grounds, you're committing adultery. Does that mean I commit adultery every time in this new relationship? No, one time, but just think about it. You know, okay, so, okay, so I'll do it one time and then just get forgiven. You know, just think about that. Think about that attitude. God, I don't care what you say. I'm just going to do what I want to do anyway and then ask your forgiveness. A little bit of a skewed theology, right? All right, so are there any other reasons for divorce in Scripture? Just those two, divorce and remarriage, adultery and desertion. So we got some questions, right? What about abuse? Abuse is, is despicable. And anyone involved in that 
if you're a guy or if you're the abuser, you, you got to get some help. That's just, that's just shameless. Physical, emotional, verbal. We're always going to counsel for separation. We're never going to let someone stay in a dangerous situation. Never. We've gone before to homes and helped one person leave. And then we're going to get you in a safe spot and your kids in a safe spot. And then we're going to enter into walking with you through this, counseling, therapy, because if you're in a Abuser, you got some stuff in your past. And we're going to work with both of you and we're going to pray and work and walk with you and pray that God restores the relationship. We will help you do the decisions <clears throat> regarding divorce and remarriage. But again, we got to go back to what Scripture says with those two reasons. So here's one where we've got to walk with you through some, through some counseling. I'll say the same thing about any addiction. Sometimes there's financial protection that we need to do. We need to help you through. The addiction of pornography. What about that? <clears throat> Despicable. It's degrading to women. It's devastating to your marriage. Lust is a sin. And it's not specifically noted as a biblical grounds for divorce. And so if you learn that your spouse is in that, that needs to be confronted. We want to walk with you and help you through that. We want to protect your children for sure. It may be separation. And there needs to be counseling and accountability. Um, pornography damages intimacy. So uh, many times counselors today are saying, Therapy needs to be involved to rewire the perversion. And please listen to this. Any spouse, and I'm just going to talk to women, all right? Women. Please be assured that his addiction has nothing to do with your value or your attractiveness. It's his issue, and it's a sin. And it has to be addressed. And we want to walk with you through that. Maybe separation for a long time. We'll, we'll, we'll help you think through what you're going to do in the future. But let's just go through this one step at a time. We've been doing a, for years we've done a <clears throat> podcast with The Journey. And uh, Dave is launching a, a new podcast called Let's Chat, and we just think these podcasts are going to be complementary to each other, so we're excited about that. And so we've been recording uh, some podcasts. We'll release some in September. And one couple <clears throat> we met with, just a, a beautiful couple, um, the husband had a, a secret sin. And um, his wife said there was a, there was a time where I, I just couldn't stand it. But she started praying, God, would you, would you do something to my heart? And God softened her heart with other people and reading some things and getting help. God softened her heart. And then, then there was a day when she said, I, I, I can't do this anymore. I, I've, I've got to get help. And so because of an incident, she, uh, she called. They weren't going to the church at, this, at our church at this time. Uh, she called the pastor of the church and said, you know, here's my husband. He's in leadership. He goes on mission trips. Here's the sin. And so it was confronted. It was, addre it was hard. It was confronted. It was addressed. And by God's good grace, they are such a godly couple today serving significantly at our church. You see, there's nothing that God can't do. He can take brokenness. That's, his, that's kind of his specialty, isn't it? He takes broken people and he does some great, great things with them. It's a hard topic, isn't it? Because I know a lot of you have gone through some challenges and uh, you did everything you could 
and it just didn't, it didn't, it didn't, end, it didn't end the way you wanted it to, and it's painful. God has good work to do in your life. We'll talk about that in a second. Two, two things I want to share with you. Here's the Bible. We have uh, premarital counseling. We require six sessions, and we, re- and we do it with a mentor couple. And if you say, I don't want to do that, then we say, okay, but we won't marry you here at the Bible chapel. That's the deal. Years ago, 25 years ago, uh, I was involved in a, uh, the Greater Pittsburgh Partnership for Families Marriage Policy. Uh, premarital system, we said we would commit to having a premarital system, marriage enrichment, developing leaders and mentors. And by the way, being in, being in this, you can see all the partnership churches that we signed our name. Being in this uh, really uh, prompted me to do my doctorate in marriage enrichment because I just saw so many things, man, that just destroy families. So um, premarital counseling, we, we, we just recorded some more things for that. So we updated it. Uh, we have other people involved in it. We have some counselors who are speaking in. I'm interviewing some counselors and, and uh, some finances. Three things blow up a marriage. You know what they are? Money, communication, and sex. And so we, we address those things. We also have mentor couples who will walk through it with you and a mentor couple will will help you see things maybe you're not seeing. I know this is not 100% of the time, but there's a majority. If there's abuse in a marriage, you could probably look back and see abuse in in the dating relationship. But see, when you get that married, playing that wedding, you got those glassy eyes, you can't see stuff. And so you need people walking with you to say, hey, that's an issue. And we've done that. We only marry believers, two believers. And if you're living together, we will not marry you until you separate for a period of time. One, you're having sex before marriage, which is immorality. We're not going to start your marriage on a good foot. And secondly, the statistics are these. Couples who live together and get married... 70% of them, I'll say it again, couples who live together and get married, 70% get divorced by their 10th year. It's just not good odds, right? So we got to make sure that we do things God's way. We're not going to be perfect. We don't bat 1,000 with our, we're better than 100, but we don't bat 1,000 with our premarital uh, counseling, but uh, we want you involved in that. Uh, Secondly, this fall, we're gonna do um, a marriage enrichment class. I've done this probably 20 times in the past. COVID hit, we kind of got off schedule. But we're gonna do something a little different. We're gonna do something hybrid, a hybrid approach, because because I want couples with young kids to be able to do this, all right? So here's here's what we're doing. We're gonna meet. Uh, The first meeting is in October, October the 7th. We will will have an in-person time together on a Saturday morning, probably about 9 to noon. And then after that, after we kind of set the course, then we're going to have, we're going to meet online. We're going to meet Zoom for uh, four sessions. And we're going to have, we can have breakouts in Zoom. We can do that. If you're traveling, you can still do it. You can put the kids to bed. We'll, we'll meet from 8.30 to 9.30. Put the kids to bed, and uh, we'll have an hour together. And then we're going to come back here on um, November the 11th and have a recommitment ceremony. We've done this again 20 times. This is my, one of my favorite things. We've had, we've had uh, women wear their, wear their wedding dress have a cake, we'll have a cookie table, we'll do it the Pittsburgh uh, way, and uh, we'll have a blast. You can invite a uh, family, and a lot of times couples will say, that's the first time I did my vows as a believer. It's a pretty powerful time. So if you want to be involved in that, uh, that'll be online, we'll give you more information about that, but it'll be a fun, a fun time together. We're going to try this hybrid approach, we'll see how it works, but again, we're doing it so that you can get your kids in bed. And, uh, and join us. Okay, one more thing, and then I'm done. Nancy Mace, remember Nancy Mace, the Republican con- congresswoman? When she got all this blowback on uh, social media, 
She said, hey, give me a break. I go to church because I'm a sinner, not a saint. All right. But you know what? A Christian is a saint. Because a Christian has been set apart by Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Here's a whole list of sins. But that's who you were. You have been washed. You have been sanctified. That's the word holy. That means set apart, saint. And you've been justified. So we don't have to live in our brokenness. We don't have to live in our regret, whatever the regret is. We don't have to live in our sin. Let's quit talking about so much our brokenness and our sin and start talking about our Savior and identify our identity in Him. He's the one who changes everything. Whatever you've done, whatever your regrets, He's the one who changes everything. You see, when you know Jesus, not for one moment has He forsaken you. Not for one moment has He quit loving you. And His forgiveness is real. And it's lasting. But the words of this song kind of wash over your soul and then we'll come back and pray together.
with me to pray. And by the way, if you've gone, if you're going through a separation or going through a, a divorce for whatever reason, it is uh, painful. We have a great ministry here called Divorce Care. They actually start a, a new session, a season of sessions on Monday night. You can go on our website and check that out. And uh, that might be the place where you want to go and really get the, get the encouragement and help that you need. Father, we thank you that whatever we're going through in our life, if we know Jesus and we know you as our heavenly father, there's not one moment, not one second, not one nanosecond that you don't love us, that you don't care for us, that you've forsaken us. Father, we may not be proud of our pasts, but we thank you. That's who we were, not who we are. And I pray, Father, that we would live as those who have been washed, those who have been set apart by you, sanctified, and those who have been justified by Jesus Christ, declared not guilty and clothed with righteousness. Help us to demonstrate to 